that. Hello, everybody. What the flick? American gods have finally landed on our shores. Uh, we're all very, 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 very excited uh, for this new series from obviously creator Neil Gaiman and producers Brian Fuller and Michael Green, who are with us for a very special What the Flick. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Thank Glad you for having us. Yeah. Thank you so much. For not uh, uh, turning American Gods into, I think, every other show. I think a lot of people are responding <laughs> to this pilot saying, I haven't seen this. This is odd. I don't think it could be like any other show. I don't know, everyone's always would pretend like what would be the the like 2000, 2001 NBC version, like God Squad. <laughs> like, they would all get together in Mr. Wednesday's giant uh, Cadillac, I would assume, maybe just like a VW bus, mm. and they would solve mysteries together. Yeah, now that is a spinoff I'd like to see. I think you could probably work with No, no, that. we'll get there. Okay, yeah. I think enough people in the 80s worshiped Knight Rider that maybe <laughs> David Hasselhoff and Kit are still actually driving around. That's true, it's American civil religion right there. Okay. The trunk of his car is a tangent universe. I like this. Now, the the concept of American gods is that uh, gods are real. Enough people believe in gods that they become real entities, and then they're still among us, even if perhaps uh, they're not being worshipped as actively. And America has this rich history of immigrants, and there are gods all over the place. Why do you feel that this concept isn't just a good story, but why do you feel this is really important right now? Why does this just series need to get made? Well, it it, it really was about releasing it now as opposed to making it now because when we were making it, it was a progressive administration and the country didn't seem quite as insane as it does now. Uh, but in the last year, there have been political platforms both here in the UK and growing in Europe that are actively anti-immigrant. And what this story does is celebrate the immigrant experience as a historical tentpole for what makes America, America. And that is now is a, is a good time to be exploring that. It's also, it levels the playing field of the validity of all religions, which is something Neil explored in the book, uh, which we really responded to, which is it doesn't play favorites among religions. Uh, a God character who's doing better or worse is just a function of how many people happen to be giving that God their attention at that time. It doesn't mean that any one religion is truer than the other. It just may be currently more popular. How does it feel to have, you know, obviously working from Neil Gaiman's book, which is not new, it's been around for a bit, but you're creating this story and then the context shifts while you're making it. Can you tell me about that experience? Well, it didn't shift while we were making it, it shifted after we completed production. Yeah. And uh, it, it's interesting because the, the show now has an amplifier that it didn't in a progressive administration. So that, that changes the perception of the show. I think the, the show hasn't changed itself. It's just the perception of the, the subject matter is going to change because we're in a very divided country now. You open uh, this episode and many other episodes with a coming to America segment, which shows how a particular God came to America. And in this particular one, we find out how Odin came to America. And it really does portray sort of the Aryan experience as the first immigrants to this country. <laughs> Can you tell me about that sequence? Because that's a, obviously that's it's violent, it's insane, <laughs> and it's unusual. Well, there's, oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Uh, there's something interesting about it now as tying to this kind of patriotism and nationality where, uh, where the Vikings arrive on the shores and are immediately met with people who are like, fuck off, <laughs> like, get out, this is ours. We don't want you, we don't need you, just. Bright Step American no flag, further. blue arrows. Yes, and and that felt like uh, it, it wasn't certainly our attention at the time, uh, but that now watching it in through the prism of everything that's happening, it's it's like oh we are. <laughs> we're, it's a lot smarter than inviting them over to dinner. Yes, <laughs> yes, as as they probably should. Yeah, it's such an impressive environment that they're now fighting each other to leave. Right. Yeah. Right. In fact, and I, one little detail I noticed, and I didn't even really notice it the first time I watched it. I watched it the second time. Uh, they go shirts versus skins, which I thought was a good choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was that a little joke, or is that just how you're going to keep them straight? Or uh, it just seemed practical. I think it was like, well, we have to have a war because that's what our god seems to like. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nothing. Nothing more than Viking logic. Yeah. The violence in this episode. A lot of this episode is Shadow Moon and Mr. Wednesday talking. That's a significant portion of it, is conversation. When it gets violent, right at the beginning, 
in particular right at the end, it's like Mortal Kombat 2 fatality violence. <laughs> <laughs> why, why is that so important? Uh, there's something poetic about the violence in the show that we really feel is reflective of, of the faith bargain that people often enter into uh, when they practice religion. And religion has a very violent history, particularly in the United States. So it seemed only authentic to portray a little bit of violence when you're talking about how you worship because we see Christian extremists in this country going to great links, uh, great violent links to protect their perception of their religion. And so the violence that we have on the show, we try to make as, as hypnotic and beautiful as possible. But for those complaining about violence and religion, they should probably yeah. take a peek at the Bible. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a little bit, it's a little bit like Terry Gilliam meets Leviticus. You know, like in Leviticus, there are all these loving lines about like, and then the priest will take you know the blood from the red heifer and splat it on the side of the altar and. I, those images would go through my head when we were looking at like, let's just have a long slow-mo shot of blood arcing through the sky. Now I really want to see that movie, Terry Gilliam just doing the Bible. Leviticus, that'll, yeah. be, that'll be the next biblical adaptation. It sounds great. I'd um, love to get Terry Gilliam to direct some episodes of season two. You should do Absolutely. it. Absolutely. <laughs> he's not doing, you know, he's, 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 he'll, he'll make the time, I'll call him. Uh, <laughs> You have a protagonist on the show. You're gonna have this huge sprawling cast of gods. Your protagonist is Shadow Moon. And what is very distinctive, I think, about Shadow Moon in a lot of ways is that unlike a lot of television series, unlike a lot of novels, he's not the most driven protagonist. In fact, he's actually being driven by other people throughout the entire narrative. Mm -hmm. What's What makes that intriguing and also what sort of challenges does that create for you as showrunners? Um, Intriguing is that he's on a journey, he's on a faith journey. He enters uh, with his mind open, he's sort of that empty vessel who's at first uh, reluctant but ultimately willing to receive. So that the strange encounters he has just starts to fill a soul that was probably a little too empty at the beginning. He turned love into a religion and that religion crumbled with the death of his wife and finding out that perhaps she didn't love him as, or that the narrative of their marriage wasn't quite as solid as uh, he had imagined. Mm. Uh, Challenges for adaptation are more, you do need, you know, in a visual medium, you need people to be doing things. Thinking is not uh, quite as cinematic as one would like it to be. So it was uh, a question of getting him to vocalize, to get him to emote, uh, and to get him to participate in the madness around him. Sometimes that's being challenging, sometimes that's asking the questions, uh, but really just leaning forward and being an active participant. Mm -hmm. uh, as people see in the next episode, he gets to Chernabog's apartment and the Zoria sisters, and they're very strange and very particular and have customs and offer to read his uh, fortune out of his coffee grounds. And he has something to say about that. It isn't as simple as just leaf on the stream. Yeah. Well, Neil Gaiman's novel is in many respects very much a travel log, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. going through different gods, going through different geographic locations. Um, do you worry about that when it comes to pacing? I mean, there's a big chunk of the book eventually where Shadow Moon gets an apartment and lives in a small town for like a year, I think. <laughs> it's like a while. Like, well, tell me about that because this, this, you're, you're adapting a book, but it comes with problems. Uh, the, you know, the because the book is from Shadow's point of view, you're inside his head, and so even his passive passivity uh, is interesting because he's able to tell you what he's thinking. He's able to tell you when his feet hurt. He's able to tell you when his back hurts, and and he's able to puzzle over things non-verbally, and that's great in a novel, but. Uh, for the adaptation, we had to make him a little more proactive, a little more challenging. But it is, it's an ongoing challenge for the series mm -hmm. is how to take Shadow, make him a proactive character and keep him authentic to the character in the book. Well, you know, a, a book is just simply a different art form than right. television. You have to adapt a lot. Brian, when you did Hannibal, you had to take a lot of the material, but you also had to remix it. Right. A lot to make it work and also to make it sort of surprising for people who are already fans. How much are you planning to just straight up adapt American Gods and how much are you going to 
move things around and potentially even stray from the source material. It's like a lot and a lot. Is yeah. The answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, what, what, what's what's significant? Like, what's what's like the focus? Do you have like a mission statement when it comes to that? Well, I think the it starts to shift focus from the novel with episode four, uh, and uh, that's only because Laura, who's a relatively minor character in the book for us as a major character and someone who has as much agency and import in the narrative uh, as Shadow and Wednesday. So uh, you take that instinct and inspiration that we had with that character and you apply it to other characters we were inspired by like Mad Sweeney and Bilquis mm -hmm. and wanting to see what they were doing when they weren't on the page. And that was something that was very exciting for Michael and I. Uh, because we were able to take all of the toys that Neil had laid out for us and uh, come up with with answers ourselves. But just the same, Brian and I were equally excited to approach sections of the book that we loved and thought stood on their own. Mm -hmm. So that fourth episode takes a big turn off and explores new avenues. And we come back in the fifth and we start with two big sequences taken relatively straight from the book. Um, shouldn't say what they are, but it's the, the first coming to America and then a very, very long set of scenes right after are things we were just excited to get to, but we wanted to make sure we platformed correctly and interest, as interestingly as we could. Now, beyond simply writing it, you're creating an entire visual uh landscape here uh, with a lot of different influences. You know, We get to v visit Technical Boy's limousine, which is damn near out of Tron. <laughs> and then we also get to the huge sweeping vistas. And Brian, you do something really cool when your episodes air on television, you tweet out different behind the scenes photos and notes and influences. It's like getting a live commentary track. Uh, one thing you noted in this episode, and we were talking about before we recorded, you are inspired by the golden child <laughs> for one sequence. Uh, Michael and I are, are big fans of uh, the golden child uh, and talk about it frequently. <laughs> And uh, there was a sequence where Sardo Numspa, as he's uh, phoning his demon overlord and all the bricks fly away uh, to reveal hell. And we essentially said when we were seeing Laura in the ceiling and all the tiles would fall away to reveal her, that we wanted that to feel like Sardo Numspa's phone call to hell. Um, so there's those types of things because we're both pop culture geeks, we're going to be giving random obscure references that most of the directors, we kind of have to Google some shit to, to show them Do illustrations. Do you have to screen Golden Child for David Slade for this or was he already familiar with it because it's a was cinematic it, classic? I don't know. <laughs> David also in his own way kept bringing us like, because he has so many visual references, yeah. you know, just down to like the face hugger in episode one. No, we, mm. we did not have to Google face hugger. <laughs> But that was face grabber. Face Don't grabber want to get too. Sued. Ooh, Excuse me. Face grabber. Yes. It's the shinning. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Exactly. Um, I don't know. It's just uh, we we go we start with things we love. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything in particular we else we might have missed in that first episode that is a shout out to something particular? There, it feels like every episode mm -hmm. is chock a block I with yeah. uh, those references. Um, I'm trying to remember what happens in the episode I know, going there, through. It's, we're like we just locked uh, the final episode, so our heads are in many. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me. Okay, let me ask you about a couple of interesting visual cues I noticed. Loki Lylesburg, he's a character we see him in the in the prison. And one thing I don't remember from the book is in the movie he seems to have tusks. <laughs> yes. Tell so, me about the tusks. First of all, I love that you made him Jewish, Lylesburg. Look, he's like, <laughs> Lysmith. Lysmith. <laughs> no, no, now wow. I'm just like, it's a whole other Jew Norse, okay. Yiddish mythology. Yeah. I am fired. He hangs out with the golem. I'm fired. And the Dybbuk. Yeah. Um, no, no, so <laughs> this is all Jonathan Tucker. Should have written that one down. So Jonathan Tucker is an amazing <laughs> actor that we've all seen and loved in a million things. Brian's had the good fortune to work with and I hadn't, but I've always wanted to. Uh, our chance comes to bring him into the fold here. And you know it's it's a smaller role. We're setting up playing long game, hopefully with him. Uh, but we knew we wanted him in the pilot, and that we were going to come back to him. So we wanted an actor that we really liked for it. And uh, he, what he texts you, he's like, "Hey, hey, Brian, what's Loki's spirit animal?" <laughs> and uh, Brian tweets back. Um, I don't or know. Or just text. Or te yeah. It was intimate. It was a personal <laughs> conversation. <laughs> yeah, sorry, text. I said tweet. Our lives have gotten weird. And uh, just wrote back, Badger. <laughs> and he was like, great, got it. Consider it done. And so he goes, what did he, he buys pelts to keep uh, under his- He 
bought uh, badger claws, badger pelts. He sent me pictures of, he's like, my wife is out of town and I've got the bed all to myself. So he was, he spread out the badger furs and the badger bones uh, so he could soak in Loki. And he's got so many different approaches to acting that are incredibly fascinating. And, and one of them is this sort of animal symmetry approach to a character. And so he was grounding uh, Loki and the badger and the, uh, the, uh, the, teeth. the teeth, the tusks. When he him. asked you this, did you know it was gonna be this important? Did you just flip out badger off the top of your head or did you really put a lot of thought into it? Uh, yes is the answer to that question. <laughs> uh, he asked, my first response was, Oh, he's a badger, and uh, then we unpacked it, and so we followed our instincts. Fair enough. A lot of a lot of the American Gods experience is uh, we hired artists whose work we admired, and when they came to us with their crazy ideas that they were expecting to have shot down, mm -hmm. we said, "Let's double down on that." I realized where I got Lylesburg from. He was uh, <laughs> he was the leader of the Nightbreed. Oh right, yeah. right. Yeah, yes, there yes. you go. That's where I picked up that from. So I'm not entirely crazy. There are I'm some just similarities wrong. with yeah, American enough. Gods and, and Nightbreed. Mm -hmm. Well, they're both playing with those uh, again. The idea Old of gods, the immigrants and the xenophobia, yeah. and the, yeah, we're going to have to deal uh, a lot with that. Uh, so we've got a good old fashioned leprechaun fight mm -hmm. <laughs> in 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 this episode. Is you're doing a story about America. You're doing a story about traveling across America. There's got to be bar fights. I've, every Chuck Norris movie I've ever seen is like wall to wall bar fights. It's it's like ingrained into I the culture. It's like crazy films too. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Pain don't hurt. Yeah. So can you tell me about this whole this whole sequence, which is basically just all the, all these characters getting drunk? Your protagonist doesn't even know exactly where everyone else is coming from. Someone just flat out tells him he's a leprechaun. He's like, sure. And it's got to lead into this this moment of violence in a bar that's shaped like an alligator's mouth. <laughs> Tell me about this bit, because this is a really interesting sequence. I think a lot of people are responding to it and they're enjoying it. Uh, well, you know, there were definitely adventures in shooting that sequence because we built the set twice. Uh, so uh, if you were subscribing to Entertainment Weekly and you saw the first look photos of the Crocodile Bar and <laughs> compare them to what you saw in the show, they're they are incredibly different. And because the show was so sprawling and there were so many sets to build and we, we didn't really have standing sets to go back to except for the Crocodile Bar, which we only returned to two additional times, uh, construction was overwhelmed and it was a set that did not get completed to our uh, standards. And so when we were shooting it, uh, there was a, a sad awareness that we were gonna have to do it all over again. Uh, and so that kind of, the crocodile bar took on a life of its own in the, the mythology of the production because all the actors had to come back and do things twice. Mm -hmm. And Eric Stoltz originally played Shadow Moon in that he sequence. Did play he Shadow Moon. To, yeah. he played, no, he played Mr. World. <laughs> <laughs> Who we haven't met yet. I'm really, no. really excited about this. So we we meet like a couple of gods here who we only see for a little moment. You got uh, uh, Mr. Ibis, uh, and uh, and then Bilquis, of course, has this showstopper of a sex scene, um, which is so. I'm actually really impressed by the visual effects in the sequence because she expands so subtly. Yes, and it's hard to tell at first. You just think, oh, this is just a camera effect, and she's they're pushing it to the foreground to make her look larger. And no, she's just just. Very just shoving that subtly, guy. Yeah. Uh, ben, can you tell me about creating that sequence? Um, a lot of it was in conversations with David Slade, who had to figure out how to make you know the words on the page feel real. And we wanted something hypnotic. We wanted something transportative. We wanted something that wasn't just a sex scene, uh, but ultimately strangely plausible. Hmm. So. That became uh, a form of worship. So you know you're approaching a god, and you're starting. And the more he starts to believe in her and worship at her feet, the more she becomes grand to him. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, you just sort of, you don't really perceive it. It's, mm -hmm. you know, this When we first meet her, it looks like you've done a little bit of makeup to make her look a little less yeah, glamorous. I think the the yeah. hardest thing I think we had to accomplish was to make her less luminous because yeah. just Yutide Badaki's, uh, in every other scene she's in, she just glows and that's just her natural way. Yeah. Um, we wanted to show someone who's been through a lot, who isn't doing as well as she used to be. And one of the, things we're incredibly grateful for is that we found an actor of the level of depth she can bring to it. So that the scene became about vulnerability, about loss, 
uh, much more than it became anything uh, was about just the, anything salacious. Yeah, uh, technical boy. That's another fun, but it's a wildly different character. There are all these old gods. Here's a new god mm -hmm. we finally get to meet. And and what was your sort of visual conception of his universe? I joked that it was a little bit like Tron, but it's <laughs> actually not really, aside from maybe a little element. Like, where were you coming from there? Well, there were a few different inspirations for the technical boy in terms of what the aesthetic was going to be. And it was like a Nintendo 64 was was our aesthetic touchstone. And as David was talking about the gods and the nature of the gods and how they're made up of thought form, which is if you believe in something enough, you can manifest it into reality. So we wanted some visual indicator that these people were not necessarily made of the same stuff that we are. Mm -hmm. And so David designed a Sladar rig, which is a multi-camera device that you shoot the actors from a variety of different angles, get enough information, and then we take it to Booth, who was one of the visual effects houses working on the show, and they are able to take that information and reskin somebody and take aspects of their performance and just take all the surface information and replace it with chiclets or enoki mushrooms or smoke, whatever they chose to replace it with, they could do. And that was part of filming it. But we originally, uh, the reason it got so virtual reality oriented is uh, Shadow is supposed to be grabbed by the face grabber. Yeah, and, an evil Oculus Rift. Yes, and uh, anesthetized in some way that he would regain consciousness in the limo. But when the network saw the first, uh, the dailies of the limo, they were like, that doesn't look like a limo that we have ever recognized and it's too weird. And we're not comfortable with how weird that is because it doesn't feel like reality in any way, shape or form. It feels like a virtual reality environment. And we thought, oh, okay, let's go with that. Let's yeah, it was initially <laughs> their it was their pitch Problem for solved. we should probably reshoot it in a plain old limo. And we're like, what, what about that virtual reality idea? Yeah, and that informed how we physically got into that scene with sort of the three D printing of Technical Boy and his environment and his children, children, his henchmen. Yeah, we see a lot of we see a lot of henchmen in movies and television series, and often they're just dudes in suits. You guys have like. Droogs, but with like don't no say the D word. We'll get sued. No, okay. <laughs> there, you have anti droogs like you, but like tell me about like what sort of influence you got going there because you've got that like Dick Tracy faceless look as well. Like that's mm -hmm. they're such distinctive hench persons. We're just big Madonna fans. Who isn't? <laughs> Madonna is probably worshipped enough that she could be an American god by now. Yes, yeah. probably. Yes, there absolutely. we go. Yeah. But like, can you tell me about those characters? Can you tell me about those designs? Because I, I love these all these disparate visual elements you're creating here, and they yeah. fly by so fast. We don't necessarily get a chance to really focus on the amount of creativity that goes into them. Um, we wanted them to be distinct. Uh, we we thought of the technical boy as someone who uh, is probably painfully aware of his own lack of originality. So he's something <laughs> of a movie quoter, and so of course he's going to build his henchmen out of bits and pieces of thoughts and of, of things he's seen before. Mm -hmm. Hence, relationship to films we probably shouldn't mention, or the legal team will just <laughs> burst through the door and like this interview is over. Yeah. Um, and uh, but the, you know, we the facelessness we wanted something that was just more horrifying than because we went through every iteration. Should we get big scary guys? How can we, we make had them masks at one mm -hmm. point? Uh, and then um, it was uh, I think we, uh, you realized I hadn't seen your favorite Twilight Zone episode. Oh right, and then we start talking about mannequins, and then we start talking about the thumb heads, and then we start talking about the Dick mannequins Tracy. episode is your favorite. If your favorite episode, yeah, after hours, interesting. Yeah. And uh, why? There's so many great childhood episodes. What is it about that episode that really grabs you? It's a very intimate story between a woman and her mother. So it starts, and then reality is pulled away from this woman, and she doesn't even have a mother. And so all the the, the manufacturing of identity that we get from consumerism is put on play in a wonderful metaphor and it's creepy and insidious, but has a happy ending. Mm -hmm. So, and that led us to what's uh, just the, the creepy non-identifiable face. Yeah, are there, are there anything that like, 
When you think about all the influences that you have, is there anything that you're looking for to try to add to American Gods? Is there like a, a key moment that's just really, really important to you? I realize this is a vague question. I think really for any of it, it was trying to find the human moments in things, mm. the, the humanity with Bilquis. In the mm. book, Bilquis was a prostitute and uh, we didn't really wanna have a main female character who was a prostitute, uh, so we, doubled down on her being the goddess of love and how uh, the uh, Tinder apps and uh, the, the dating apps are really about people searching for some sort of connection and that felt like it humanized her in a way mm -hmm. as opposed to making her less predatory because it's already so inherently predatory that uh, with that, with Laura, with uh, any of the new gods that come in, we were always looking for ways not necessarily to jam in pop culture references, but to ground them in some yeah. sort of emotional reality. And that it goes back to like why we reshot and rebuilt the Crocodile Bar. We always wanted the world to feel like a recognizable world, so that when you when your feet started to lift off the ground, you knew that you knew what the ground you'd left was. If we started two bananas, then. We would. I, the goal was always to make people believe it could be real. What about the cultural evolution that occurred since the original publication of American Gods? You talked about those Tinder apps, for example. Uh, those didn't really exist in that form when American Gods were, but now you have to deal with that and that might affect your narrative. Well, neither did social media yeah. in the way that it, it does now in Facebook. And you know, we've, we've, we've mentioned before that what has essentially happened in the intervening years that uh, American Gods was published is that we've gotten very comfortable in hemorrhaging our personal privacy and we are completely exposed in a way that we haven't been before because we give anybody information that is remotely curious about us. They can know what we're doing during the day, they know what we're eating certainly and they know what we're working on and they know our political viewpoints because we're expressing them so uh, clearly and openly. So that's something when you talk about the Mr. World character as somebody who knows all. And there's a line when we introduce him where he says, I know people and you're people. And uh, that's something that is much more insidious than I think people are aware of. Well, it's even creating a new level of idolatry. When you think mm -hmm. about it, we act, we actively say, I have followers. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the sort of thing you didn't really get to use to say unless you were claiming to be a prophet. Right. <laughs> you know, like is that something we're gonna be able to, to delve into in, in great detail in the future or is that? The, we, we talk about that very explicitly in, in scenes. It's, it's about who's following and how many worshipers you have and how do you get them and the internet and mobile devices are a great platform to get people to to pay attention to you and that's what the gods want. They awesome. just want your attention. Well, you guys, thank you so much, by the way. I think you did a really impressive job of taking very difficult material and not just visualizing it, but making it really captivating. And the response has been great so far. Okay. So I don't know if you've been seeing the blurbs on all of your, your newspaper ads or whatever like that, but like, how has this been? How has it been to watch this first episode unleashed and see the response? Do you feel like proud parents are, is it still weird? First of all, what's a newspaper? <laughs> uh, sorry, media. Um, right now, we've been so inside, it's been a two year plus sprint. Um, I think neither of us have ever been in through anything that was, I mean, we've worked on large shows, but this was larger by an order of magnitude. And I think, uh, and we just put the finishing touches on our last episode minutes ago. <laughs> Um, that's and not we're even. Still hoping there's yeah. chances for us to. Yeah, we're we're, we're going to go check in on trying to and, uh, evolve <laughs> it further. So um, right now, uh, there's just relief that it's out there and it's uh, other belongs to other people, not us anymore. Yeah, that's nice, and if we hope they enjoy it. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, again, uh, we'll be back next week with more American Gods. It'll be me and Alonzo Drale, and we will be reviewing it in a more proper capacity. <laughs> and we'll be able to say what they did was great. And if they did anything bad, we'll talk about that too. But this has been a really great interview and thank you so much well, for joining us. Well, next week you get Peter Stramari and Cloris Leachman. Ooh. So. And the introduction of Orlando Jones. Orlando Jones. I have seen that bit you, you, and that yeah. bit is, that's, that's gonna be great. I can't wait to see the response to that. It's such a good yes. bet. So uh, again, thank you very much. Thank Michael you. Green, thank Brian you. Fuller, American Gods.